Hey everybody, Dr. Rob Silverman here. I'm with Dr. J. I'm excited to be here. We're very informal on this podcast and we've got a great topic to cover. We've got a great doc. Um, it's, it's probably something that everybody's gone through a car accident. I know I've had a few. Um, of course, it was always the other guy's fault. But nevertheless, we're going to talk a little bit about car accidents and most predominantly whiplash. But first, let me bring up Dr. J. He's the author of multiple books including the Physician's Guide to Whiplash and Soft Tissue Injuries. He's a speaker, coach, and a practicing chiropractic physician, and he's committed to the growth of chiropractic on a global and a national scale. And he's a great guy because we we're just out in Utah and we got to spend some more time with each other. He was my Uber driver. He was very conscious of some of the issues I have. I don't like heights, as everybody knows, so he gave me a nice, smooth ride. But he's here to share a lot of insights on something that everybody's had, a car accident. Hey, Dr. J, how are you? Awesome. Thank you for having me today. I'm happy you could be here. Well, let, let's go for it. I mean, you got the word whiplash right behind you. What's yeah. a whiplash? Well, whiplash is a cervical acceleration deceleration injury. In other words, we're experiencing, instead of the, the compressive forces, if I use my hands here like the spine and the, the disc is in between, we're, we're designed for walking and running. We're not designed for a sheer force going through the spine. And that's whiplash. That's that's what it is. It, it results so in does, soft tissue injuries. Yeah, okay. So you said a couple of things. It's acceleration, deceleration. So it accelerates this way, going forward, correct? Mm -hmm. Inflection. Yeah. Yes. And it decelerates coming back. Yeah. It can be sideways as well, but that's it's mostly just defined as as forward and backwards, correct? So it's going accelerating to front or to one of the sides, and uh -huh. it's a you know it's funny you said soft tissue because the brain is made of the consistency of jello, mm -hmm. and yes. the skull is one of the hardest bones in the body. So it goes, let's say it goes forward, and then it slows down, correct? correct. So you're pulling on all this soft tissue. So, yes, yeah, so you've got shear forces, not just through the, the ligaments and discs of the cervical spine, but shear forces through the axons of our nerve tissue in our skull. That's that's not good either. Concussions wow. are, are one of the most underdiagnosed uh, injuries in motor vehicle collisions. You know what? It's funny you mention that because Dr. Work just asked a question about concussion. Does a concussion usually ac accompany a whiplash? Yeah, very, very often. And so that's why if we're doing a, a workup on a, a recent auto accident patient, uh, we should be asking some questions, not just about you know, headaches or back, the, the typical stuff we ask, but we should be asking some concussion related symptoms. Are they sleeping any different? Do they have fear of traveling in a car? Uh, are they more cranky, emotional changes, moody, there's a lot of list of questions we can ask that kind of trigger some concussion concerns. And then you can go into something like an ACE form to really pin it down or refer out to a, a concussion specialist if you get enough red flags. So whiplash and concussion, they're not synonymous. They're similar in mechanisms and they can occur from a car accident, that being a whiplash and a concussion. You know, it's very funny. People always think whiplash is damage to the neck. Right. So if I ask a lot of practitioners, They'll say, yeah, whiplash is damage to the neck. Would you like to expand upon that? Yeah, that's the most common definition is for the neck. Uh, but there's all these secondary things. I and mean, we've got this head, this 10 pound bowling ball on top of these tiny muscles and ligaments in the neck. And this is the interesting part in court. A lot of times they'll, the opposing counsel will hire uh, biomechanical specialists will go through all this junk science of, oh, you know, this low speed collision uh, only is like sitting, sitting from a standing position into a chair or like riding, riding a roller coaster. The, the occupant can't possibly be hurt. And they go through, you know, there's this many miles per hour, the screech marks are only this long. So this is what they think happened. They, they calculate all this stuff and don't realize that we as the occupants experience a different set of forces. For example, if the car, the star, target vehicle struck from behind by the bullet vehicle, this bullet vehicle is going to accelerate at XYZ force. But the occupants, since our car seat loads like a springboard and then launches us forward and then the seatbelt engages, our torso experiences more forces than the car itself and our head and neck experience even more than the torso. So it's a completely different set of, of, uh, of my biomechanics, which then can create 
a whiplash, because this is at the very end of all that whipping, right, is the, the brain inside the skull. We don't have to lose consciousness, but we can still have a concussion. We don't have to hit anything. We can still have a concussion. Just the force of the fluids, the cerebral spinal fluid, flushing quickly to the front of the back of the skull, we can have a liquid-induced concussion. Pretty crazy. That's amazing. So people don't realize that um, a lot of people that come in that are post-concussion, like you said, the seatbelt, which they should wear, you can see the mark. I mean, it's like a bruise on the seatbelt. And like you said, you can't see the whiplash. You know, like, like you can't visually see it. But what's going on inside is very detrimental to people's overall head. So it is in the neck. It is in the head. And in a concussion, it's the whipping back and forth and the tearing of material inside the brain, like an axon, that really poses yep. an issue. And that, too, occurs in whiplash. So we've got Kathy. She said she's the whiplash queen here. She loves the subject. And Mary, brain gets all shook up. It gets all shook <laughs> up. You know, it's funny. We've had comments from women, two women. Are women more susceptible to whiplash injury than men? That's a great uh, question. And the, the answer is yes. The research shows that because men have 15% uh, more neck muscle and muscle strength, that because women have less, they're 30% more likely to have whiplash, whiplash type injuries. Even though they see the car, male in the passenger seat, woman driving the car, boom, same forces. She's 30% more likely to be injured. So with that being stated, what would you recommend as a doctor of chiropractic who specializes in whiplash injuries? What would you tell the women who are concerned about the fact that their neck's a little weaker, let's say, genetically? Yeah, I just we always want to get checked after a car accident, male or female, or kid or adults. We just want to get checked by a certified motor vehicle collision specialist. Uh, there are different specialties in chiropractic, just like there are in medical. We wouldn't go to a podiatrist, a foot doctor for brain surgery. They're both medical doctors, but they have different training. And I think we need to respect in our profession that some of us have chosen different specialties. So women, for sure, get checked. But don't um, don't brush under the rig because let's face it, women are busy. They're, they're either moms doing a super hard job or they're working moms or they're don't go, oh, you know, I got to take care of everybody else before me. No, the stuff can be perpetually getting worse. So you want to treat it early, get in, get diagnosed properly, get in there, get the the chiropractic, physical therapy, massage, maybe some hyperbaric oxygen therapy for the concussion or see a concussion specialist. Don't wait. Excellent. You know, um, it, it's really funny that you say that because, and, and we won't go on a diatribe here. We'll just say for us, as far as we know, chiropractors are, the, are a great choice to deal and assess and treat whiplash injuries. You would agree with that? Absolutely. Since the 50s, and the research has shown we're the, we're the kings and queens of auto accident injury rehab. And without question, and then there's advanced training that we're going to touch upon. We've got a bunch of questions. Um, May may has been in several car accidents. How would someone know if they experienced whiplash? So if they don't go to the chiropractor or they didn't go to the ER room or they went to the ER room and they got a more cursory, they got an x-ray, how would yeah. they know that they got whiplash? Well, let's address this in the depths of the thing. If you experienced a, a car accident, chances are you had some sort of whiplash or cervical acceleration, deceleration injury. The research from Croft and the San Diego Spinal Research Institute shows that eight miles an hour, excuse me, five miles an hour or higher, eight G forces are higher, we're guaranteed to have some sort of soft tissue injuries. So it doesn't take much. If more people are injured in low speed collisions than in high speed collisions, actually, according to the, the numbers. Now, to be fair to the statistics, more people are killed in high speed collisions, leaving fewer injured people. So we've got to look at this from both sides of the, the uh, equation there. But chances are you, you've had some sort of whiplash. Now, some of us, are pretty resilient or we have a little pain tolerance so we may not notice for years but the degenerative arthritic changes start in those joints from that point of impact so they may not show up on x-ray for five seven ten years they won't show up at all if you're doing some sort of rehab and therapy uh, i'm assuming that most of our audience is chiropractic physicians so that if, i'm sure they're getting care if they had a car accident they're not just going oh well i treat patients but i'm not going to take care of myself we got to be a we got to practice what we preach so that's in, in her uh, to her advantage I'm sure she's gotten care, so that should have helped. But chances are she got a whiplash. She had some care, but I won't tell you who treated her because if she's not better, I'm not <laughs> taking the blame. But it, it, it's a, you made some great points that we want to um, unpack a little bit. Really good. Number one, it's soft tissue injury. So everything outside the bone is soft tissue. Correct. So that's number one. Number two, you know, you said that you won't see it on an x-ray. You do not see soft tissue on an x-ray. Correct. 
So it's an assessment, it's an MRI, things of that nature. Number three, on the x-ray, when you see it, you're talking about arthritis. So that's already in some ways an immovable object. So everybody knows. And um, x-rays are great. You know, they're ruling out fractures and malpositionings, let's say. But, you know, again, you need that person who sees this all the time and nobody better than a chiropractor, especially a chiropractor trained in whiplash. Um, I got one for you. And, you know, everybody who's watching, please keep it coming. And we got great questions. So Dr. Work, he's back with it. Great question. Can whiplash occur in sports as well, like football and soccer? Oh, absolutely. And that's where we was really brought to light a few years ago in the movie that came out about the football players and the whiplashes. And then from that really is where we started opening up people realizing that more of this is happening in car accidents than formally recognized. But yeah, in sports all the time. In fact, women soccer players are the number one highest uh, whiplash injury um, in sports. Right. And women have that whiplash injury or concussion injury because of the heading, which is literally mimicking that. And football players are number three, but we see the or the, like you said, to the side. And actually the side is much more common because the muscles on the side of the neck are weaker than the muscles in the front and the back of the neck. Um, children, a lot of people, oh, they're fine. We were in a car accident. They're not complaining of, of anything. Do children need an assessment post car accident if they're in a car? Yeah. And that's honestly, that's what triggered me to actually start this book. Whoa, where'd it go? The this is the only published book I know of on the planet that addresses kids in car accidents currently. Um, and the reason it's so important is kids get hurt. The, the adjusters will say, oh, kids don't get hurt in car accidents. Are you kidding me? The research shows the death rate is exactly the same as adults. Matter of fact, this is where this, the research came up with that book is I was looking for studies with kids in car accidents. All I could find was deaths. There was no injuries post car accident. And so as I kept looking and looking, the only thing I could find, and it used the exact same terminology, whiplash, acceleration, deceleration injury, was uh, shaken baby syndrome. It's an acceleration, mm-hmm. deceleration injury on this child with the head whipping back and forth and a little bit of a rotation component, very similar to auto accident stuff. It's just one was on purpose because somebody lost their anger and the other one was unexpected. And the data overlaps perfectly. So kids do get hurt in these car accidents. They're resilient in not showing symptoms uh, as much as us adults. And there's anatomical reasons why. If you remember from our embryology growing uh, growing from that point forward, the disc space to the bone space size was equal. And as we grew and became adults, the bones got bigger and the disc spaces were smaller. So now as adults, a little injury, there's not as much room for inflammation there before we're going to be impeding a nerve where with a, a child, there might be more anatomical space in there before we're putting pressure on the nerve to cause the pain of the symptoms. So there's reasons why the kids don't elicit the symptoms as much, but the degeneration starts at that point. So if we have a kid that's in a car seat, for example, you know, and they're rear facing and they've got this super strap, their, their head, which is a third of their body size as, a, as an infant, boom, just had all those forces go through that head and neck with the weak, weaker muscles than us adults. So that, yeah, kids are so susceptible to injury and we need to get them checked after a car accident for sure. I mean, a car seat, you throw away, it's the law. You get rid of that thing after any car accident, but we, it's, why isn't it the law to get this precious cargo checked by a specialist afterwards? I mean, that, that was a great point when you went like that, that was a huge takeaway. I mean, that should be literally your little video clip explain to everybody the disc is big. It's, it's, it's full grown, but their bones aren't. They're small. As the bones grow, the disc gets smaller. And of course, you can even take it to the next step. That disc gets thinner and thinner and thinner through gravity and compression as unfortunately as we age. And the disc is critical because what is it? It's the cushion. I mean, I tell people, you ever sit on a couch? If there's no cushion, you go right into it. Ow, your butt hurts. But there's the cushion. Great takeaway. Joe says, hello from Tampa Bay. Got another great question. Everybody's engaged today. It's excellent. What are the most common treatment protocols for acute whiplash injuries after the physical exam for the cervical spine? Yeah, great question. The Croft guidelines are the most widely accepted guidelines in the world. 37 states, nine con- different countries. We, we need to learn and utilize and leverage the Croft guidelines properly, but they only apply to the neck. 
So it gets a little tricky when we start talking about mid back and low back, you have to use other guidelines or, or just use your doctor confidence. But the, the crop guidelines for the neck, amazing. You know, when you look at a grade one says, hey, I, even, I was in a car accident, I have a pulse, but I don't have any symptoms. Well, then anybody in a car accident is going to be at least a grade one's worth of care to make sure that they rehab properly, including a kid. You've got an argument now, the attorney can leverage why you're treating this child this time with no symptoms because it's a it's designed with the research to be proactive so that there aren't problems later. Uh, but the crop guidelines are amazing. And most of the ones that you see in your office will be a grade three. Now, the crop guidelines are not a carte blanche like, oh, you are, I did this exam. And x-rays, measurements on the x-rays, that's another powerful thing for x-rays is it's, we're looking for fractures, of course, but we're also looking for misplacement, overlaying flexion and extension to measure between each segment. And you can send out the x-rays and have experts do this and send you back a report. Uh, but any measurement over th three and a half millimeters of movement is ligament instability. That's something that's only caused by a trauma. It's a permanent impairment and it increases the, the, the value for the case for the attorney arguing for you and it helps you understand, hey, look, they're gonna need more care. Not only do we not need to get them feeling better, but now we have to strengthen the muscles to do the ligaments job besides their own job as the muscles because the ligaments are, they're not gonna bounce back from that. So uh, does that point. help answer that question? Yeah, that's great. Now, Croft guidelines and we won't, uh, they can look them up. They're C-R-O-F-T, the Croft guidelines. But you said something about the ligaments in the neck and that's interesting. So we've got bones, you know, everybody knows what a bone is. We have a tendon which goes from a muscle to the bone. So they supply some stability and we've got ligaments, which is bone to bone. So when the ligaments get injured, they're the slowest healer out of the bunch. So that's one of the reasons why you see such a long duration of time. Also, can you, how fast do you have to hit somebody to damage a, a ligament in the cervical uh, region? Well, they, they did some studies uh, and I can't quote it directly. I have it in some of my equipment in the, and in the book, back of the book. Uh, where they took cadavers and at five miles an hour or eight G-forces and above, there was ligament tear every time. So it doesn't take, a, it takes a lot less than we think. I, I want to help you visualize a, a Newton's cradle where you got the little steel balls. We take up the little ball. That's the mass in motion, like what we call the bullet vehicle striking. Boom, the target vehicle is those center ones. And then we, the occupants are the last one that takes off. So if there's no visible damage to the car, boom. All the energy of mass and motion is transferred from frame to frame to us occupants. And that's why it doesn't take a lot, even a small speed collision. Like, oh, there's no damage to your car. You can't be hurt. Well, there's no, all, no research correlates damage to vehicle and injury to occupant. And I like to use the example in court. Like, well, if that's the case, let me hold this piece of paper up to your face. And I'm going to take this baseball bat and I'm going to smack it. And let's just see how much damage is done to the paper and how much is done to your face. Nobody's going to want to do that, obviously. And it's like if we're using the paper as the car, just because there's no damage to the car doesn't mean the forces didn't transfer through the car, the vehicle into us and cause harm. Now, you said G-force. How many G-force yeah. again? G-force, eight Gs or higher miles per hour, roughly five miles an hour. And then, of course, you got to look at the mass of the vehicles. Eight, eight G-force. If I took a 20-pound dumbbell. And it was studied, yeah. not just me, anybody. And we dropped the dumbbell down, you know, then 20 pounds is, you know, everybody can do 20 pound curls. That's 15 G force. Wow. So just to match what we're saying, that that's quite impressive. So, okay. What would somebody do after car accident? What kind of um, assessment would they get? And then while I ask you, what kind of treatment would you recommend for those who have a whiplash slash concussion type injury? Let's, let's address that in two parts. First part is, it's, it's nice to see a certified motor vehicle collision specialist. Whether our docs are certified or not that are watching, you can always refer out to that and then get referred back for treatment. Uh, a really good example is, uh, you know, in the, we got to act more like, more professional like the attorneys and the medical profession where they've all kind of carved their niche and specialty. You don't go to, you know, Uncle Vinny, the divorce attorney for your personal injury stuff. It's, it's different cases of law and we don't go to the brain surgeon for foot stuff. Like, and so in chiropractic, we've got some, we've got 43 different diplomates in our profession from sports chiropractic, pediatric, and there is auto accident diplomates in this stuff. So we know we can talk the talk medical because it's a medical legal case. It's complicated. We want to make sure we know what we're doing. And if we don't, and we want to still treat auto accidents patients. If we refer to a certified specialist, they're going to do the initial exam, workup, diagnosis, send back, you do treatment, and then send back to them at the end so they can do a final exam. And they're the parentheses around that case. So you still get paid for your care, 
But now if somebody else goes to court that knows the talk and walks the walk, talks the talk to help represent that, that patient. That said, we want to do a proper exam. There's a, a good orthopedic neurological chiropractic exam. We want to be checking on their nutrition because they're probably going to need some anti-inflammatory nutrition so they can heal from the inside out neurologically with chiropractic and uh, biochemically with proper nutrients and keeping the toxins out. We're going to want to do x-rays because we have to, it's a trauma. We got to check for fractures. We also need to do the right measurements, which are penning and AMA that, that uh, the attorney can then leverage in court to make sure that the patient gets proper restitution. If there's ligament instability, it's a grade three. That's a, that's a game changer. That's a lifelong injury. If there's disc injury, that's a... So anyway, if there's a fracture in the neck, that's a big driver. Now, a lot of times, I'm going to just go down a rabbit hole. This will come full circle. If we have a side impact or our heads turn when we get rear impacted, chances are 65% of us are going to have a compression fracture of the uncinate process. Now, that's a broken bone in your neck. It's self-limiting. self, it, it, it's, self it's going to heal on its own but you won't even be able to see it on x-ray and you have to take a special x-ray about two months after post-trauma. But that's a big value driver for the, the case that we don't wanna miss as the doctors. So then the case management is once you've got your workup, diagnosis, and you might need, you might need an MRI. It depends on what, if they've got ridiculous symptoms or they're not responding well to chiropractic, physical therapy, massage in the first uh, couple weeks, then you refer out for the, massage, the the MRIs and see if we need to refer to a surgeon or not to get an opinion. Hopefully they just refer and go, no, they're not a surgical candidate, but we got we to gotta dot the I's and cross the T's as their primary physician. We chiropractors are typically the primary healthcare provider in a post motor vehicle collision case. So we've got to so, be comfortable communicating with them. So ortho neuro tests specifically, um, their diagnostic tests. I come in, I have whiplash, forget my torticollis, I have whiplash. Give me some treatment guidelines or some suggestions so people out there know what to do, both in an office with a practitioner and maybe some home care. Yeah. So, you know, if we follow the Croft guidelines, which and the other research that's out there, and it's in the back of my book from the 50s to current, we're going to start with chiropractic. It's a chiropractic is a passive rehab. We're going to start with ice and e-step and massage. Those are passive things that we're trying to do to reduce inflammation. Inflammation causes pain. We want to reduce that, the pain and get that patient comfortable. That's month one. We want to tell them not to exercise and not to do their regular routine. They want to get back to life as quick as they can. Oh, I want to go to the gym, but it hurts to go to the gym. Yeah, and we don't know if that's what's causing your taking so long to get better. So please don't exercise for the first couple of weeks. Maybe some gentle stretching. That's fine. Ice, not heat at home, right? After a month, then we can graduate. We can do a re-exam because we should be doing re-exams each month or every 12 visits. That is that is very important, especially in a personal injury case. And then we can change course. Hey, you look like your symptoms are improving. Your objective findings are improving. Let's graduate to some physical therapy. And either do more physical therapy on, on site where you're strengthening or send off site to a physical therapist. In a personal injury case, if there's more licenses on the ca case with care, it looks better. It's stronger, a case for the, the attorney. So if we have a physical therapist or a medical doctor that they see besides us, it just makes the case stronger. I don't care what state you're in. That's really helpful. If it's a sole practitioner case where there's only one doctor on the whole case and it's us, the chiropractor, we know that we're the best thing out there. The research shows we are the best thing out there post motor vehicle collision, but the legal system doesn't understand that. The jury doesn't understand that. So when we have multiple cases, that's, that's helpful. Is, is that helpful there? Yeah, that's quite helpful. That's real helpful at home. You know, so a lot of people come in and, and I do suggest, and I'm sure you will echo it that, if you've had any trauma to the neck, whether it's a whip in a sport car, whatever, I mean, even when you say five miles an hour, that's just somebody bumping to you in a parking lot or in yeah. a shopping center. I mean, how, I mean, I'm in New York, so that's commonplace. I mean, it, we drive intriguingly to say the least mm -hmm. with, with all that being covered. Um, what kind of home exercises do you recommend? And is it never too late? It is, there is a point where it's too late for maximum benefit. And that's where the Croft guidelines are also beautiful because they're going to, they're going to figure out what stage the patient's in. We're going to do more healing in stage two. Stage one is within 72 hours. Stage two is 72 hours to 14 weeks. And that's when the body is actually form, forming scar tissue. So here's another great, great example you can use with your patients. I got to try to set this up in this camera where it works right. So. All of our tissues in our body are parallel fibers. Muscles can contract and relax. 
tendons and ligaments have a tensile strength this way, much like if we turn it this way and it's a cable for a suspensory bridge, strong, up, down, crosswinds, not so strong. Cobweb, very strong tensile strength of steel for the spider at the bottom. But if we go across it like this, it breaks the cobweb pretty easy, right? So if you and I are in a car and we're designed for walking and running and all of a sudden we get a shear force through us, it forms scar tissue, which are crisscross fibers, much stronger than regular tissue, but not as pliable, not as functional. It takes up more space. So if we have a nerve that's right here, and this is slowly growing over the next two years, which is what the research shows by two years, we've got chronic pressure on that adjacent nerve now for the rest of our life. So with chiropractic, we're adjusting, massaging, using the physical therapies to strength, strengthen with tensile strength to help it lay down healthy parallel fibers instead of just a bunch of unguarded super glue in there. Very nice visual that you can use with your patients. Most of them get it. That's why it's so important to treat early, uh, 72 hours to 14 weeks. Anything we do in stage three, which is 14 weeks to uh, like a year, not as quick. So we got to do more work with less reward. And then after that, it's chronic. It's just, that's, it's, you're, you're managing a lifelong bunch so of muscles. So muscles start like this? So it starts damage. parallel fibers. Right, parallel. That's a great, parallel that's fibers. the word we're looking for. Yeah, and then with it builds crisscross. So they, it's like this, and if I turn it this way, you can see it. Ah, boy, I get hard. So if there's a right. nerve right here, now all of a sudden we're putting, we've wrapped that scar tissue around the nerve for the rest of our life. Where if we just had been adjusting it, massaging it, we would have helped it lay down parallel fibers, which don't take up as much space ah, as the crisscross stuff. So all the treatment is pointed at making sure that the remodeling of the damaged tissue uh -huh. is parallel like it was in its initial pristine condition. Correct. The almost perpendicular crisscross. Oh, I don't, I don't know where. <clears throat> it's, a, it's an image that I use on my reports for my patients, my PI patients on the initial report. It just paves the way. And it is so powerful. I had to pay good money for the rights to this picture. I don't know if you can see this here. There we go. Where it shows this, uh, the scar tissue. Oh, I'm having a hard time with this camera. It's root. Yeah, yeah, there you go. You got it. Man, that is crazy. I can't get it. Yeah, you just there lost it. All right. There you, you can see there the you scar go. tissue Perfect. on the one side and the healthy parallel fibers as they healed properly after chiropractic and PT. So what we do is amazing. And you can see it on a microscope, a microscope electron microscope that this stuff works. We're the best thing for these people, but they got to do it. And they got to do it frequently. This is another thing. And this is really, really important for your listeners. And this is a game changer for them, uh, both with outcomes and finances. The research shows if we're treating somebody three times a week or more, chiropractic, physical therapy, going to the gym, it's active care. Less than that is passive care. We're not going to get the results if they're coming in once a week, twice a week for a lot. You're going to get better results seeing them more frequently, the three times a week or more for that, uh, the first initial few months. It's really so in intensity, frequency, and duration is the key element to outcome. Absolutely, especially in soft tissue and ligamentous injury. Excellent, excellent. So man, this has been great. I mean, we could be here all day. So I got a few questions. Like I said, people always use the phone to ask me a question. So they here, here's the, here's some interesting questions. I had a lot, uh, but the interest of uh, not draining you. They said, how common percentage wise is a whiplash slash concussion injury? I mean, what's in the patient accident? population numbers? Oh, general population, I don't know. But in the in the, in the the car accidents, it's pretty common. I don't have an exact statistic on that. That's uh, that's a really good question. I wish I had an answer for you on that. But, but it's I would prominent. say it's in the 10, 20%. Yeah. Okay. So, and we've all had a car accident. The other yeah. question that they wanted to know is, what what about traction for whiplash injury? Traction, traction is good. And you were asking about some home stuff. I, I recommend at a certain point you start active strengthening. I really like the MedEx machines uh, and an active traction, which is passive. They're passively doing traction to help because most of the people are going to get it. They're going to they're going to lose that natural curve in the neck after the whiplash. And we got to work on getting that curve back or they're going to we palliate the symptoms, but we haven't fixed the problem in the, bio, the biomechanical function. So. Passive traction, amazing. Uh, there's a lot of good, the CBP stuff is really good post motor vehicle collision care where they're working on a home traction unit to help with curve restoration and disc imposition. So Jonathan loves the content, gracias. And Jonathan, it, it's our pleasure, uh, con mucho gusto.
Nice. And I, I just want to invite everybody, you know, there's a lot of good courses out there. What I like to do is kind of a Parker format where I put together the whiplash group seminars and get some of these coaches from across the country. So we have a one hour, 90 minute classes. So you can get a flavor of these different ones out there, but we really go over procedures in personal injury, marketing, uh, staff training, C training. And our, so we've got a great seminar lined up in February of 2022 in Salt Lake City. So come skiing and then come to this <laughs> seminar. And uh, that's uh, February 25th through 27th in 2022. Got some great a combination of really good speakers and coaches that you can get pick their brains as well. So how can they uh, get more information on that? And how can they uh, get a ticket? Um, is it live? Is it hybrid as we're doing now, et cetera? Yeah. It's 100% live. It's old school. It's uh, whiplashgroup.org is where they can get the information on that. And if they have any questions, there's ways to contact me on their email or, or, or you can call. But we just love getting butts in the seats, getting together, rubbing elbows from across the country. I do have a, a sponsor of one of these awesome air purification systems. So it'll, it'll be squeaky clean and, and safe and, and, and fun in person. Those air purification systems are great. We have one in the house, one in the office. You recommend it to all the patients. Yeah. Um, it's, it's it's not just good in the current marketplace. It's good in general. Um, oh, we got a, one more question before I ask how they get in touch with you. I did exactly what you said one day later and on to many, do many other docs. A mistake by a pain doc had his license taken away, yet he didn't believe everything he said. I had it all and he's spot on with my severity. It sounds like she's giving you a ringing endorsement that she had wished she had seen a doc like you versus somebody who may have not been quite as uh, schooled in the injury and the dynamics of whiplash. So for Kathy and everybody else, how can they get in touch with you? Well, again, whiplashgroup.org. Uh, our number is 385-257-1700. And, uh, or you can email me. I mean, you're welcome to email me at drj at shetland.com or info at whiplashgroup.org. Those are both going to work. And yeah, happy to help answer questions and serve our profession. Fabulous. It's been my pleasure. This has been great. People love the content. We have to get you back on. We have to talk a little bit more. But everybody, my good friend, Dr. Jay Shelton, the man who knows whiplash better than anybody. Uh, thanks, Rob. Have a good one. Yep. Dr. Rob Silverman, always yours in health.